will kick off. So good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining our latest Tales in Tech live webinar. Uh, I'm Simon Evans, a director at Burn Sheehan, and I head up our software engineering team. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've run dozens of events over the years, but the success of our webinars have been fantastic and the reaction in our community overwhelmingly positive. Uh, it's a great way to raise your company and individual pro profile, so please let me know if you are interested in being part of one in the future. This latest installment of the Tales in Tech series is being hosted by Giuliano Alves, a senior software engineer at TransferWise, who will be risking all by showing you how to build a streaming engine from the ground up using Scala in a live coding session. Happy, he's happy to answer any questions you might have at the end, so please use the available Q&A function. Giuliano, over to you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me start sharing my screen over here. I hope, just double checking, can everyone see my screen now, my IntelliJ? Yep. And then now you can see my terminal, right? Yep. Okay, oh, wonderful. All right, so I'm Giuliano. I'm here to show you uh, what I've been building on kind of my free time. <laughs> What's pretty much a, a basic streaming engine, uh, as I call it, from the ground up. Uh, this is my this is my blog. Uh, this is my Twitter. Just hit me up on Twitter if you have any related interesting questions. I'm one of the, uh, I've been working with software development for my whole life. And I'm one of the, I've been always involved with, with, uh, with open source and I'm one of the maintainers of Quill, one of the tools uh, that they'll be using to build this streaming engine. So here's the thing. We have maybe 40, 45 minutes. I suppose it's the whole, even it's a relatively simple streaming engine, it's already complex enough. So if you have any questions, please uh, take notes and ask about it at the very end. And um, because this one involves a lot of different technologies and the integration of technologies that are relatively new to some extent, uh, I'll, I'll have to assume that you guys already know uh, some of that, right? Some of that, uh, that tech stack. At the same time, I'll try to give an introduction about, uh, about that as much as I can. So here's what we, we are building today. Uh, we will we stream uh, data from our database, right? We are in the moment where everything, the world is run by data and we should make sure that all the data can flow from A to B. And we have many, many, many data on our database nowadays that are just stuck in there. We have to make sure that we can make it flow. Um, so I, I hope with this uh, webinar, with this coding session, you can see uh, how you can actually make that uh, static data flow as well. So, all right, let's get started. So we will be, an endpoint, we stream that data. So here's what we will be streaming. We will stream data from our database. We have the world database and we'll be streaming all the cities in the world, uh, in the world database to the world. <laughs> and the idea is, okay, we're gonna do that via, um, well, I have something here that's making noise. Uh, we will we'll be doing that via HTTP. We will be streaming that in the format of uh, actually JSON. Uh, it's not that different from, let's say, Netflix, right? They are streaming data. That doesn't matter the format. More important than that is the fact that we are just, we build a flow of data, an infinite, infinite flow of data. So let's get started. We have our city here, right? Pretty standard. It's just a case class. And then uh, just to not uh, get in the way, I'll show you that we have this basic configuration, right? Because eventually you have a database here. A very simplified one could be any other connection for a database. And then we have this uh, simple configuration for, for, our, um, for our HTTP server. If you are new to, uh, if you are new to Scala, to pure config, uh, this is pretty much an object that represents that configuration, right? And soon enough, uh, we will have just that configuration as code. We need that. Uh, okay, we have our main here, and our main is a Zio app, right? A Zio app basically, uh, well, then again, we, I'm assuming you guys have a, a few, a little knowledge about, 
about Scala already. So what ZU is, is like probably you've heard about Cat's Effect, right? Cat's Effect is, provides you with like, uh, with an effectful way to deal with the external world. In simple terms, we have a city and we can add behavior, not exactly behavior, we can use a type class, let's say option of a city, where now we have a city with the capability of being present or not, or we have try, you probably heard of this one, that allows us to an attempt to something that could be successful or a failure. We have either where we have something that can work or fail. And then you have IO from cats, which basically says that you can interact with something else and that you produce actually a value here for you. The difference is when we are talking about Zio, what we have is actually this. So I recommend anyone that doesn't know it to go to the site, have a look. What it says is we have uh, an environment that can fail and we have a possible result that will be produced. So for instance, we, uh, yeah, we use the environment for dependencies, the E to declare possible failures and the A is our final result. So let's say we have this program over here. This program is actually a zeo that takes a console it cannot fail and it doesn't return, returns in unity, right? So if you run this one, it will just print out uh, at the end the, that message that I left there. It's recompiling. Okay, it's alive. So here's the thing. Uh, this is a dependency. This is uh, when I say nothing, I am saying that my program cannot fail. That makes sense in the context of, let's say, um, we have failures we can predict and they are, they are somehow part of our system. Let's say I'm trying to find something in the database or calling an endpoint and that resource doesn't exist. If it's a not found, it's an expected error. But let's say that I'm trying to uh, run a web server and it somehow fails. It's not acceptable in the sense of, it doesn't make sense to try to recover from it. So it's better if the whole application dies in that case, right? So let's start actually with this server. So we have the HTTP here, right? And um, I'll create a new server. My web server, we will have a dev run server. And this run server is already interesting because we will have some dependencies here. Uh, here, uh, we'll be using HTTP4S to build this server, meaning that it's part of the CATS stack. So we will need a few things. To have that running, we need an execution, execution context. We need uh, that's the technical part, right? We need an execution context. We need the effect per se. In our case, that would be a zero effect, right? And we need that configuration we have right here, right? We have this server config here. So you need the config. So uh, what we will have, ah, yeah, and that's an interesting one. We, we are talking about a web server. So you have a, a way to, let's say, control uh, time, right? So because we are working with CEO and then again, uh, sometimes you just have to trust me in a few of my affirmations, but I uh, will have a CEO here. Let this method will, this function will return a CEO. Um, Let's fix this one about control time. Zio has a clock in the environment, right? And with that, I can actually control time. That's something that is necessary in this case here. We will have, that won't fail. Like I said, it's a server. So if it fails, it's better if the whole application crashed. So we don't have to try to recover from it. And then that won't return anything. We'll have like a server running. In order to fix the execution context, we will have access to zero runtime. Uh, then again, for anyone that doesn't know Zio, uh, it's, uh, I recommend you to have a look at Zio in the, I think it's uh, zio.dev. 
there, there's a lot of content over there explaining the details of uh, how I'm building that now, right? So the runtime, okay, the runtime, we need to access the environment we have, the clock, uh, and then we will flat map that in order to find this execution context here, uh, we need something that's already provided by Zio. That's the RTS here. RTS will give me my execution counters via RTS dot, oh, oh sorry, please here, RTS, RTS dot, um, it's in the platform executor SSE. Okay, and why do I need that? Because I'll be building a Blaze, Blaze, Blaze server, Blaze server builder. This guy takes an effect, as you can see here. It's an effect that takes just one parameter, right? And then it takes the e execution context. Um, here's an interesting thing. As I mentioned before, Zio has these three parameters, right? Uh, R, E, oh, R, E, A. And this guy takes just one parameter. Because we have more parameters, it's easier. What it's actually expecting from the cat stack, it's an IO of A. Uh, so what we need is to, let's say, observe these other two guys here. So that's not that difficult because Zio already has it's all type aliases as well. So there you see. Okay, never mind. Uh, but it has something that's a task task of a. What's pretty much is the same as zero that doesn't have anything as a dependency. Uh, it can fail with a throwable and it can it produce an A, right? That's not A. That's pretty much what we need here. But here's an interesting thing, and uh, I'm telling you that just you, you have to trust me on this one. We need the environment, right? We need the R here as well. So task is not enough. What we need is actually a Rio of R and A, which is pretty much what we need here. This one is A. So we will observe this one and then you have the environment. It will be necessary to work when we start building the, the endpoints. So just to make it more, let's remove it here. Just to make it a bit more easier to read here. Let's define a type alias of ours as well. We will have a server Rio that's actually a Rio of lock and A. And that's a box video here, server video of A. So we can build our Blaze server builder with this server video here. And well, that. Oh, yeah. So another important thing, because uh, this integration is relatively new, you're integrating through different stacks, uh, Blaze server. Builder HTTP for us in general is expecting to work with cats. Uh, even though they are similar effects, they don't work um, with each other by itself, right? So we have a very useful integration built by the Zio team. That's the Zio interop with cats. And then if you just import it, everything will work. It will fail here, actually, <laughs> but this is expected, right? Because uh, I'm promising to return a zero, and I'm having trouble with this Blaze server here, because that's what uh, happening at the moment. So let's just start building that with bind HTTP, where, oh yeah, we need our configuration, right? We don't have that yet. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, this is the environment, right? Our environment just has a clock. Uh, this is provided by Zio as well, but what happens when the, the, the environment needs something that we should be providing? So we have uh, a way via Anzio to say, okay, this, uh, this guy here can be used as a dependency. So there is this has type that allows to say, oh yeah, you have, uh, you can, uh, <laughs> you just 
indicate using has that that class that object that function that service will be a dependency so in our case first of all uh we will have to do that but this is the way uh, let's say we have the http server and the db config here and they are both dependencies right so let's just create another one here oh, no. in this case let's create a package object and then we will have a type let's call it configuration which is a has of http server config with http uh, no, db config oh no has of db config db config so with that i'm indicating that uh configuration composed by those two guys here, uh, they, it can provide what we need. So if I go back to the server here, and then I say, okay, actually what I need is clock with configuration. configuration. And at this point, I will have, um, oops, sorry. Yeah, I'll have that available as well. So because, uh, the environment is polymorphic. I can just say that we have that in, available in the environment via get, get, and I'll indicate I need the HTTP server config, right? And that's it. I have all I need here. Now I can just go and say, okay, config dot uh, port first, and then cfg dot host. That's uh, what we need here. We have to serve it. And then we have to compile it. So, oh yeah, this server, it works as a stream by itself. It's already modeled as a stream. So we have to compile that. And this compile method takes two par three parameters here. One, two, three, to make it easy. Uh, it's just the same server, server Rio here. Server Rio, server Rio, and an exit code, code from cat's effect in that case. And then we will drain that, right? If I compile that, I think it will fail because, uh, oops. Okay. Uh, because it's not being provided yet. Um, but we are saying that cannot fail, right? And if I'm not wrong, at this point, it will say, oh yeah, you are saying that it cannot fail, but it can actually fail. That's true. So in that case, I'll say that, or die. I'd rather kill the app than allowing that to try to keep going in that case, right? And I think this will uh, compile for now because we are not using that. Uh, all right. Uh, our server doesn't do anything at this moment, but let's make something a bit more organized. Uh, first, we will move this guy. This one will be our app environment, right? So that's why I have these environments here. Uh, I, here I'm talking about um, the way that I enjoy um, organizing my project. So I have, have the type of environment that compose those two clock with configuration i think it's easier and that will be useful later so that environment okay so we have the execution context we have zero control time config is there already the last thing we need to have a http server running we have to serve some uh, routes right so you have our create routes here and then we will use the cfg dot um, path cfg dot path right so let you create a method for us here's an interesting thing and that's another one that i think you have to trust me if you have never worked with um with cats before. When I start putting this, um, these uh, routes together, uh, it will say that it's expecting an HTTP app, uh, but this is kind of confusing. What it wants, it actually is an, an, an structure that cats called a Clisely, 
that pretty much expects an effect, a request of that effect, and a response of that effect, and that you compose then when you do your HTTP request, right? So something I do trying to make it easier. Oops, I'll have this one. Um, I will have, then again, this one, if we can talk about this later, but just, just trust me about this one. I'll have my, no, uh, sorry, uh, let's call it server routes. Server routes will be a Clisely on cats of server view request of server view and response of server view. Okay. I'll need this guy here. And then I hope that we just compile. I believe if I try to run this one now, it will compile and it will fail because of that. But if it happens, it's what we are expecting. So the server is trying to start. And because um, it's configured to die in that case, if it's failing uh, on when it tries, oh yeah, it, nothing happens if you don't try to use it, right? So let's just say server dot server dot run server. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Um, we are saying that that's one of the great things of working with Zio. I'm trying to run the server here. It's complaining basically because I have defined that my application needs uh, that that app environment, but I'm not providing with the app environment yet. So what we do is we go back to the configuration and now show uh, what's the way that Zio does that. We have something here that's called a life. This life will be a Z layer, a Z layer uh, that doesn't take anything, that cannot fail, and then that will return a configuration. So it's interesting how uh, that works exactly in the same format as zero, right? So almost most of the, the um, the type classes you have in Zio, they you have like the same format, and you have the type aliases as well. But it's, uh, it, I, I think it's a good standard to follow. It's, it makes it makes it easier for yourself uh, to get used to work with it. So what we do is we will build these configurations ourselves. So you have a Z layer uh, from fact, from fact many actually, and then we just uh, load it ourselves. This is from pure config, this guy here that I left here because I always forget about it. Uh, you, and then we will have the, we'll create an effect from config source dot, the, dot load or through our app config. And because we are doing that and we don't need an app config, we need the other guys. So let's map that. And then you have uh, has of C dot HTTP server and the database already, right? C dot database, that's the configuration. And it cannot fail or die, right? And then what can we do? Um, we won't have to change this one again. If you get head back to environments, uh, we can have a vol app environment here as well, which is the uh, concrete version of those servers. So clock, as I mentioned, is provided by Zio. And then configuration, live, we have it now, right? So what we have to do is we just have, we just head back to our main, the place that's complaining, and we will provide a layer. In this layer, we will have the environment dot app environment and it will stop complaining. So now the interesting thing is the, the main idea is to eliminate what is necessary here. So for instance, I can, and that's one awesome thing from Zio, I can provide these layers in different places. So if I decide to provide it here, for instance, 
Here it's not an app environment anymore. I'm saying it's already provided and it still works. But I, I rather have it at the edge of the application in this case, because the, what I would call here a main uh, dependency, uh, it's, it's just one main dependency, even though we can compose those dependencies as well. So at this point, we, if we go here, try to compile our server, nice. If we try to run it, I think it will, now it will give the right, uh, the correct failure that's it's trying to, um, it's trying to run the server and then you fail because we don't have an implementation for the routes. So it's say there's an implementation missing or something like that. And yeah, that's exactly what we're expecting. Okay, so we have environments, we have a menu here, we have our server, and then we have to create the routes. So let's start creating our, uh, the route we wanted. Oh yeah, so like I said, let's have this guy here. So that won't be a problem anymore. It will never be, a, that will be a problem if you don't, we don't change it. So let's just, uh, just trust me here. So, okay, let's create a class that will be the, um, the endpoint here. So let's say we have a package. Mm -hmm. points. And then let's have our series. Let's call this. Again, let's call it this. Series and points. Our series and points. Remember when I said that we would need the environment here? Long story short, we need the environment here as well. So, in the same way that uh, this is still HTTP for us, right? So we still have something similar to that. We need the environment. So let's just observe the environment here. Let's just define the type. That's the series uh, task of A. And that will be the real of, oh, real of RNA. And then Let's see, we, well, let's just start building the thing. We have, we, we will have the DSL, that's actually an HTTP for, for SDSL. For um, SDSL uh, of CDs task, because we need an effect as well. It's actually, oh, anyways. And then we import that DSL, everything that it provides, so we can use the DSL from um, from from HTTP for S. So we have. Uh, th then again, that's how I structure my programs, and I'll build this one quickly, mostly because I want to show you the thing actually working. HTTP routes, and this will be an HTTP routes uh, off. Routes of series task, and then <clears throat> this pretty much makes there's a pattern matching. That's how this is HTTP for S code. Okay, so if we get our root slash um, our root slash root, yeah, the root at this moment, just to see if it's working, it returns a okay, oh, okay, yeah. Hey, okay, actually, okay. <laughs> and that will complain because, guess what? Because it's made to work with cats. So import, see you, it at all, cats, right? So this is private. I will leave it private. We will have a file routes. That's um, HTTP routes. Uh, of our CD task. But this guy will actually be a router because later on we will add another one, uh, another route. So we have a prefix path here that's uh, slash CDs. And when you call it, you get our HTTP routes, right? So it resolves itself. Let's see if it's compiled if I forgot anything. 
Okay, so I suppose that if I try to run it now, oh, no, wait, I forgot to create it in the server. So here we will actually have our um, class ladies endpoint. Series endpoint of, in that case, the server we go here. <coughs> no, sorry, the environment. Our environment view. And dot routes. And we return our router. Router of server view. Where we have our path, the one we are receiving in the method, right? The path, point of the route, routes. The series of C, C routes. Or not found. Ah, yeah, okay. That's another thing that you just have to know uh, when you are working with HTTPS. You have to import or dot HTTPS dot implicit. And then I can call or not found here. If I try to run it now, it should be able to find the uh, and our endpoint was citizen point. It's pointing out. Okay, it's running now, and it's about slash cities, right? So we're supposed to get our, okay, here, it's working, nice. So, so what we will do here, it's expose, okay, now you know it works, so you actually have two endpoints here. We will have the first one that's slash root, that is slash blocking, and we have a very similar one that would be slash, uh, and okay first of all before we go to the database let's just show that how that could actually uh, work and there's a there's a catch here mm -hmm. to make it easier we are talking about using um, fs2 stream right in order to use this guy we need an effect and we need uh, the result. So let's just make it simple. Our result will be a CD. Our effect is this CD disk here. Um, but this CD task, this whole thing would go, would be our A here when we start returning that because you always return a task of something. So to make it easier to read, let's say that we have a CDs string, right? So what we're going to do is we have that, and that's our in place. Let's have a fake one in the first moment. We have here a def, a fake CDs, which is a CD task of CD string, right? And then a CD task of a CD string, we can say that's a real because that's the one considering the environment, and then you succeed. It's, it creates an effect that will always work, never fail. Uh, and then we will have a FS2 string. And then you have a CD here. A CD has an ID and a name. And then it has, what else? Oh, yeah, string code. District the no and a population that's just, that's the population. Let me see. A population is in okay. To be a population. Okay. So here's the thing. What we will do here is we will have a pipeline. It's a common, relatively common pattern you see around. 
that is a series task of a series training, which is our big series. Commonly, we would uh, transform this pipeline with a fold. However, it will never fail, right? I mean, most common would be to have it empty, so it won't fail. So if it won't fail, let's just flat map it. And then we can just use the string here and create an OK of, that's, that's an interesting thing. We have to actually transform the string, no, the S, uh, mapping that to JSON. And that users for that we will need import io.source.syntax io to have that syntax with my syntax. And here there's another thing we need that's uh, let me remember this is kind of important. Oh yeah, we have to have import um http for s dot source that will give us the the Okay, let me see something. Ah, let me see. Fix it. Ah, not, not fix it, but not. Let me see. Hopefully, I'm not missing much. Yeah. Let me see. Ah. Ah, as Jason. That's it. Okay. Um, wow, that was, we don't have too much. Time. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, it cannot parse it because it's using search. Search works with derivation, so it knows how to parse strings. We, the okay was working was just a string, right? But it doesn't work when we are talking about uh, something that it doesn't know yet. So long story short, we could use something to find it by itself using source automatic derivation, but that tends to be very slow. So we can just define here val val encoder which should be uh, in the right encoder of cd. When you do that, uh, you start Oh, it's my oh, it's I have, ah. and that will work in the first moment. So, if I go back to my CD endpoint, uh, let's have the same here, and then if I try to run it, it will, let's see what happens. They are the same, um, but I just won't. Let's make sure I'm not forgetting anything. And here's an interesting thought. Uh, let's let's make them slightly different because one is called blocking, the other one is the one called uh, streaming, right? Okay, nice. But here's the thing. To make sure that this one blocking here, let's pretend that's not what it actually is. So to do that, we will compile. Dot to list to, to list right. So here's the difference between the two of them. This one is a string. This is an infinite string of one element. Not not, not an infinite string. Sorry, that's an infinite string of one element. This is a string. That's not a string. That's a list. I'm compiling that string. So if I run this guy, what happens is I'll call both of them. I'll call the block, the streaming, and the blocking, and you see the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's running. If I go to another tab and I call streaming, what happens is you have it right away. If I call blocking as well. But what's the difference? Like, why should I use one or another? What if, what if in this case I say, okay, let's, let's make another slightly different, uh, another thing slightly different. Let's make it repeat forever. So now we have an infinite string. Oh, not here, here. 
right? Our string is repeating that source of data eternally. No stop, you just keep repeating the same thing. In that case, what would be the difference? So, that's the, that's the way I, I found to clearly show uh, what's the difference between when you are streaming and when you are not, right? So, in that case, when you have our, well, damn it, my, my machine is about to explode. <laughs> so if I call streaming, what happens is I start to get information right away. As, I, as you can see here, I'm repeating the same information. And what happens if I call blocking? Nothing happens because it's an infinite uh, stream of data, meaning that we, it's trying to put everything together in memory and it will never happen. So I don't have much time to finish it. So now you can see how it works, right? Knowing that, what I'm going to do is... Now it's, now it's relatively easy in the sense of the difference, uh, what, what we are missing here, right? So we just have to create a repository now and change the source of data because the principle is already there. So if I create my repository here and then I'll create my, um, oh, a series of repository. So this class, okay, series repository. And then I'll say that this is you, okay? I will have a trait service that actually will be a def all of two of string to task, <laughs> zero task. At this point, it doesn't matter much, and I don't have time to explain. Uh, and see. Okay, when I do that, I will need to, <laughs> our implementation will be via Adobe, right? So let's create a class here that will be a database. The database, let's call it a class to make life easier. Uh, place plus database extends um, this repository that service. Oh. And this guy, because it's Dobby, it takes a, something that's called a transactor. A transactor, a transactor of task. At this point, it's interesting because we actually can ignore uh, the environment, <laughs> at least for now, right? And then when oh, we implement the method here, um, we are using Dobby, Dobby and Queer. Queer is the one that I mentioned at the very beginning, right? So just trust me here. We have a context that's a new Dobby con context dot h2. H2 is uh, the one we are using. Literal is something from, from Creel saying that um, just use exactly the same names as they are. are they? And then for, for the context, everything you need. So now I can just have a simple query here. Uh, instead of writing a query, I'll just use queer, queer quotations, right? So yeah, I'm running out of time. So I'll have this. Uh, instead of run, I'll call a stream with something that the integration between Q, queer and dot gives me, I'll have uh, quote uh, inside that quote I'll have a query of series and because I don't have filters I want everything that to just work this complaint here it's about guess what import zero interval cats and if I'm not wrong there's something else I need import do be implicits and then everything will work or maybe not. Oh yeah, it won't work because I forgot to transact with that transactor I'm receiving over there. Let me see if I'm forgetting anything. Zero task of CD stream transact. Okay. Probably it's just complaining as it usually would. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm using the wrong task. Port, the task. Okay. 
So we compile, we have a few complaints. Okay, it's compiling. This, uh, that's the interesting thing about Quill because I'm using that, the compiler generate the query for me. Okay, cool, right? So we have the database, we have the, the service. We just need to put some of them together. So this guy will be a dependency, right? So we'll have a value. Well, that would be a Z layer. So let me skip that <laughs> Z layer. And to build that, I have to build it from something else. So I'll build it from a service. That's the easiest way. I'll have a resource that will be uh, that will be what our database needs. It's the transactor resource That's That's complaining because it's not there yet. Let's try, let's try to solve everything all together. So I'll have the package over here. I'll have a type in transactor that uh, has of, remember we have that, uh, oh. actually I'll need a transactor first. So object uh, transactor, which will have a trace the source that will give the vol that I need that uh, transactor. Transactor of task. The transactor of task. Oof. That's import zero, import transactor. Then let's provide the proper layer as well. H2, that would be as the layer. Uh, to build this transactor, what the only thing I need is the um, well, I need that DB config that we had before, so uh, that would be uh, a Z layer has all the parameters. Of, uh, something that cannot fail will be a U U R layer. A U R layer will have a has of DB config. <coughs> And that will return uh, DB transactor. I, this is the DB transactor. It's the pass of um, DB transactor dot the source. So you have to return that. This guy will be returned here. We have that already defined by a compilation. So we can have a new resource. Yeah. Probably have like a lot of questions after that because I am just calling home stop. And then you have a transactor dot from drive manager where you have db dot drive drive manager db dot driver db dot url db dot user db dot password. Uh, do I need to? Import anything else? Yeah, of course. Import the develop cats. And that's it. Oof. Oh, damn it, that was quick. Uh, okay. To make sure that everything works, we will go back to our environment. And just to make it, um, let's say, a bit more readable. This guy is actually, a, let's say, an HTTP server uh, environment. And then we will have this uh, HTTP server environment. Uh, it's actually this guy. We will have to create the DB transactor which will be um, the DB transactor that I just built right here. It demands a has config, right? So we can just say that we have a configuration.live that has it, right? And we feed it to DB transactor. D oh, what is that? DB transactor. Oh, I forgot. Uh, <clears throat> What I forgot the yeah. transactor 
Você pode... O bicho exato. Ah, not uh, into just to fit it. So there's another one you need here. Uh, the other one would be uh, a type for series C3, which is a has of series representing dot service. If we get back here, the, we need to declare this guy as well. Uh, repository, we have just one, right? The repository is the same principle of the one above. We have the TP transactor that you feed to the series repository dot life and then I didn't finish this one. Uh, the series repository dot life resource. Oh yeah. Um, it has to know what that is. You layer of layer that cannot fail of uh, DB transactor, right? It has to receive the DB transactor and returns the series repository. Now it knows that uh, the resource has the resource I need. If I go back to environment, environment. The last one would be basically having the HTTP environment with repository. Oh man, Whew. it's even more than I thought. Uh, so to finish, we are close now. We just have to make it available over here. And um, the easiest way to do so is actually if, uh, let's write a quick, um, so uh, just an accessor method here that all series, that's actually a real series repository, and it returns our fs2 string of a task. And see, and this guy will be uh, real. And then I'm accessing the the environment here. Accessing the environment, you can just get. I did something similar previously. Uh, and here I'm accessing the the instance per se. Last but not least, <laughs> to make it available here, we could just import import streaming. Dot repository dot uh, no environment environment repository dot everything and then just call all cities instead of having these fake cities here we have all cities and all cities and I think it will complain because all cities doesn't exist in this context because that doesn't have access to the repository unless we just make it accessible cities repository. And then now uh, the I think it will be available here. I hope it will. Let's see. Because it has a Ah, okay. Okay. And now it's available if I compile. How did I do it here? Server environments. Ah, yeah, I still have my type. <laughs> type F environment still has to exist, but this time that will be this guy with repository, series repository. And then if I compile, everything compiles. If I run the server, <sighs> mm. 
Let's do another query. And the server, let's say if it doesn't break, it doesn't, it didn't. So I can call the streaming and then we start streaming my database here. That's not that big. If I call blocking, it will be slightly, it's be pretty much the same because it was already in memory. But I can, if I want, I can just loop the database and tell it to repeat forever. And that's what I had to present to you guys. <laughs> I'm slightly late, but if you have time for some questions, that's it. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well done, Juliano. That was great stuff. Um, I, I love the fact you put yourself under so much pressure there. Um, <laughs> I think everyone appreciates the <laughs> pressures of the live coding situation. So um, let's see. Are there any questions from the guys? Later on, uh, all the code, oh, all the oh, Q and A. Here we go. Code. Yep. Can you please? The difference between blocking and streaming didn't get it clearly. Oh, so um, I just built those twenty points uh, to show what's the idea. But in summary, the one I called blocking is like I'm trying to fetch data from whatever it is at this point for the database. But I'm trying to put everything in memory first, and then I'll serve it the streaming endpoint actually starts serving right away. As long as it starts emitting data, it starts streaming right away. So what I can do just to show you with the same principle is that if I come here to the database and I say that this uh, stream here, trans, I think, uh, no, in the pipeline is easier. So if I come here in the pipeline, for instance, in the, oh, the endpoint, sorry. And I say, uh, here, see, I'm compiling to list. So if I say something like uh, repeat, not before I compile, repeat, and then the same in the other one underneath. When I repeat it, what happens is I'm generating infinite data now, right? Streaming will keep working. If I call the endpoint, it starts sending me data because uh, that's the concept of of you, if you are working with streaming, right? You don't know the amount of data. Like when you are watching Netflix, Netflix doesn't know uh, how much data it's sending to you and your, your TV doesn't, shouldn't know that as well. So it's just start consuming. The first one uh, will just lock, especially in that case where I'm planning it to repeat uh, infinitely. It we will try to uh, we'll try to make it concrete, putting all, everything in the memory, but it'll never happen, right? You'll never finish. So it will just keep consuming memory. So I can even run that, um, but it's the same principle. So that's the difference between them. Is that clear? I'll, I'll run while I'm looking at the new questions. What would be a good use case, the streaming approach? Well, it, even, um, even though this is a very simplified example, right? Uh, in the sense of I'm showing JSON, even at, because it's easier for, uh, for everyone to see. Um, I could say, let's say Netflix and, and or, uh, I don't know, uh, Spotify, but it's not exactly fair, right? Not everyone is building their own Netflix, their own uh, Spotify. However, if you think about reactive uh, applications we have nowadays, so for instance, when you have, uh, I don't use that much Instagram, but even back in the day, you could scroll and keep scrolling, right? And that doesn't, doesn't uh, fill up your all uh, timeline since the beginning of the time, but as much as long as you keep like scrolling, you keep feeding, feeding what? Or let's say that you have an automatic scroll. Uh, instead of sending information uh, in blocks for every request, you just keep feeding that information. Um, imagine you have any sort of financial data, right? Financial data is always loads and loads of data. You just expose that via streaming. For the ones consuming, it's easier because they always have like a ridiculous amount of data. So you just keep consuming that. The point is the data, the only difference, the main difference is like the data will be flowing instead of being blocked and serving big blocks. Just to illustrate what I mentioned before, this one is the streaming data, right? And they streaming for the database. Uh, it won't stop because now I, I told it to repeat forever. But if I call the blocking one, it will never serve anything because we'll never finish loading that in memory. Um, when you say streaming straight away, how does that play with the JSON payload being sent back from the server? Uh, FS2 will kind of deal with that for you. Um, 
important to say there's let me stop this one because my man, my machine start, start, started to make some noise but if you go to my blog um i have I, my one of my best last blog posts the one actually about the streaming this one streaming all the way i i leave some gotchas that i figured there when i was uh, while i was building that uh, so you have like some specific details that can get in the way but as long as you get them right uh all the machinery will work to stream the data for you so the server will serve it in chunks if you see if you look at that in the if you look at the the http headers when you call it with, with curl you can see that serving chunks it will say that uh, in, in the http header uh and you say and it's streaming very similar to the PubSub model. Does it use something like PubSub that's under the hood? It doesn't use it under the hood, but you can do it, right? I think it's the same principle. Uh, WebSocket. Uh, not exactly, because with WebSockets, we, you kind of registering a way to call it back, right? With streaming, is just um, the fact that you are receiving an infinite amount of data. And by infinite, I mean, you never know when it's finished, right? So you can decide what you do with that. So imagine you are moving, a, I don't know, petabytes of data to whatever, but you need to allow your customers to have a look uh, at the newest information, right? We start from the newest one and start the streaming and then they can look at that. But if they have to look uh, to more and more data, uh, at least they are not blocked. They can see what's going on, right? Because if you have to move all at once, that you can take forever. Uh, also, like your blog, oh, our blogs on Power Programming. Thanks again. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, could you tell us how Adobe manages to generate a string out of transactional database? That one, I'll, I had a discussion with, uh, uh, with some friends in another group, user group about that. Um, I have to, I don't, that one I don't know by heart, uh, but to some extent, uh, most of these databases, especially the ones that are not um, prepared to, to stream that data, we kind of do that artificially in the sense of uh, the same way that, let's say we have a massive file, right? And we started reading that with, let's say Z, zero strings, for instance, uh, that file, it's still static data, but I'm kind of artificially making it available via streams, right? So many times our, our data source is actually static, if you know what I mean. I mean, if you're consuming a stream, it's not static, but uh, that data is static. So we artificially do that. That's uh, many times that's what we can do. And I'm kind of guessing that's what Doobie does because Doobie doesn't access, don't, doesn't change the intrinsic uh, mechanism behind the database, right? Uh, but most of the time it's good enough. Um, but according to the uh, documentation, if I'm not wrong, it says that because Doobie is a cat stack, right? And F has to super close to it. Um, it says that as long as the database emits data, uh, Doobie will emit it and it will go like the whole flow all the way. I'm not entirely sure about that, uh, but I, I didn't bother going to the uh, implementation of it and figuring exactly how Doobie does that. But the worst case scenario, it does it that officially, and most of the time it's more than enough for what you need. Uh, hello, thanks for the wonderful demo, uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question regarding Clisely. Why are you defining routes? You used the Clisely, Clisely, but I didn't get completely why uh, it was required there. And when you are working with HTTP for us, uh, it's, um, for instance, the same way that the server is built as uh, an, a string, right? The server is an infinite stream of events, let's say. Uh, what it does, what um, HTTP4S does to compose those, those routes, it takes like an effect and then it will apply, you have that effect for the request and the response. A Clisely, uh, it's, it's an alias, a type alias for a function that takes that effect and apply from the request to the response. Um, let me see if I can show that to you. Uh, 
it's saying the series and point. And if you see, oh no, sorry, it's in the server, right? Server. And then if I look at it here, see that here I have that, um, that my effect, and then I have A and B, what will be the request and response. Uh, I bypassed that mostly because uh, I, I knew I wouldn't have time. I mean, I went over time already to finish writing the app. So uh, there's not a big point in explaining that. Uh, but mostly what it does is just represents this function that takes that effect applied from request to the response. That's how uh, the server uses that. And if you are more curious, you can go to the, to the cats, uh, uh, that cat's documentation, they have a page just to explain exactly what a Clisely does. But I, I, I find it, I, I didn't, I, I, I believe it's already, building this app this fast was already uh, complex enough. I didn't want to talk about this, this smaller thing that's getting in the way, you know, when people start talking about uh, functional programming and then they start talking about functors and monads and suddenly it's just another word that doesn't say much. So uh, I was just like, okay, that will get in the way. Let me take it out of the way and then we carry on. But I would recommend to have a look at the CATS, uh, CATS documentation, but that's uh, what has Clisely does, uh, giving that context, right? But uh, as monads, you don't have to know exactly what it does. Uh, you just have to sometimes understand that that type can get in the way. If you know how to take it out of the way, you're fine and everything will work. Whew. Do you have more questions? <laughs> Ooh, I speak a lot. Okay, thank you very much <laughs> yeah. for following this, uh, this, this, this webinar. If you have any other question, uh, just hit me up on Twitter, send me a message on, uh, on, on my blog, and you can uh, just, the, the, the blog post that I showed here, uh, that's actually what inspired this, uh, this webinar. So the, con the, the idea is already there. And uh, later on, I'll share the, rep the repo for this specific one that I built right here, because uh, if you look at the, link for the, the repo in the blog post. It's very similar. It just has a few more things. And for instance, considering the Clisely one, uh, I have another route there and then you can see that I have to compose them. That's simple, but Clisely gets more and more in the way if you don't, don't make it simpler for yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Giuliano. That was awesome. And I say, we all really appreciate the, the pressure you put yourself under there and the speed you managed to go. So that's great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I hope you enjoyed that. It sounds like you did. There are some actual Giuliano fans in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and the video of this and all our other webinars will be on the Burn Sheen website and our YouTube channel. As I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any topics you'd like to hear more about or would like to present something yourself, please do get in touch with myself or our community manager, Becca. Uh, that's it then. Thanks very much again, Giuliano, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Take care.